Hello, everybody, and welcome back to To Be Like Christ for our John chapter 4 Bible study. We are going to do the first half of John chapter 4 here. There's 54 verses, and there's quite a bit to talk about here, so we'll split it again into two videos. I have about 16 pages of notes, so let's just go ahead and get into it. Just a reminder, all these notes for anyone who's new are out online. There's a link in the description below, the same stuff I'm reading off of. There's also a free ebook down there if you want to grab that. So John chapter 4. In John chapter 3, Jesus had a conversation with a guy named Nicodemus. In John chapter 4, he's going to have another conversation. And I, I the majority of this chapter is going to be a, a record of Jesus' conversation with a woman at a well, a Samaritan woman. And I want you, as we go through this, to kind of compare and contrast the Samaritan woman, what Jesus says to her, the way that she responds to it, with the story of Nicodemus. Because when we think about these two characters, they're from very different backgrounds, very different social strata. They have very different reputations, no doubt, in their community. And the way that they interact with Jesus and respond to Jesus and the way that Jesus treats them, I think is, is an interesting study in and of itself. <clears throat> Won't say a whole lot more about that in this study, but just keep that in mind and maybe in your own study, um, just just compare those uh, in, in your in your, own, in your own mind, whatever I'm trying to say. Okay, so let's read then verses 1 through 5, <clears throat> and we'll set the scene. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making, more, was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. In John chapter 3, verse 22, Jesus was baptizing in the Judean countryside. John chapter 4, verse 2, informs us that Jesus himself was not baptizing. Uh, it was actually his disciples who were doing the baptizing. And, you know, why do you think that was? Why do you think that Jesus didn't baptize people? I imagine that he didn't because it was a precaution to avoid the situation that would later arise in uh, the book of Corinthians, where Paul has to address a situation where the uh, Christians at Corinth were divided and uh, it, some of them were causing divisions centering around who had baptized them. It seems that some had been baptized by prominent apostles and they were holding that over the heads of other Christians who maybe had been baptized by less prominent Christians. And uh, no doubt there would have been people, if they had been baptized by Jesus himself, would have held that over the heads of other people. So maybe that was the reason. Or maybe it, it was that uh, God had set the task of baptizing people. Uh, it, it, he had given the responsibility to men. Jesus was going to leave. He would give his the, the mission of baptizing to his apostles. It was their responsibility to carry out. And so maybe he's driving that point and reinforcing it here by having them baptize and not himself. <clears throat> but whatever the reason, Jesus was not baptizing his disciples or doing the baptizing. <clears throat> when Jesus heard that the Pharisees had heard that he was making more disciples than John the Baptist, he decided to leave Judea and to go up to Galilee. <clears throat> the Pharisees we read about had been concerned about the success of John. We know that they loved the praise of men, and they didn't like it that John the Baptist had the attention of all of Jerusalem, as one of the Gospels tells us. <clears throat> They certainly wouldn't have liked that Jesus now was getting even more attention than John and that Jesus seemed to be in cohorts with John. Uh, so it, it seems that Jesus doesn't want to incite the anger of the Pharisees at this point in his ministry. That's not what he uh, has deemed is best. And so he decides that he's going to leave the countryside and baptizing and he is going to go up to Galilee. In order to get to Galilee... The text says in verse 4 that he had to pass through Samaria. The area where Jesus spent most of his life can really be divided into about three different big sections. So there's Judea in the south, there's Samaria that's in the middle, and then there's Galilee in the north. We know Jesus spent a whole lot of time in Galilee. <clears throat> you can see those on the map that I've included in your notes. The most direct route from Judea to Galilee was to go straight through Samaria. But, and it's a big but, 
the Jews really didn't like the Samaritans. They didn't like them at all. In fact, many Jews took an alternative route and actually went around Samaria, some even perhaps crossing over the Jordan River, going to the east side of Jordan, and then coming back west to go up into Galilee. That way they could avoid Samaria and that whole region and all their people altogether. That's how badly or how much they hated each other. And I have there in your notes a, a rough uh, picture of the the straightforward route that goes through Samaria and the uh, roundabout route. And Jesus here is going to go straight through Samaria. <clears throat> now, who are the Samaritans? They're, it's not a group that we've been introduced to yet in the Gospel of John, and, and we have a little bit in some of the other Gospels, but who were they? The, the Samaritans were a people who lived north of Judah. If you know your Old Testament, this would have been the area where the ten tribes of Israel had been located um, in uh, north of the two tribes of uh, the southern kingdom, which was known as Judah. So this is that northern kingdom, that area. So they lived up there. Second Kings chapter 17 verse 24 tells us that after taking the Israelites, that those northern ten tribes captive, the Assyrian Empire moved foreigners into Israel's land. So don't want to get into this a whole lot, but Israel was real wicked. God decided to punish them. He sent the Assyrians to come and to take them captive. So the Assyrians moved all the wicked people out of the land, and well, most of them out of the land, and then they moved foreigners in to that area. All of the Israelites who were left there ended up intermarrying with those foreigners who had been annexed or moved in. And they, they created this kind of, uh, this doesn't sound very good, but half-Jew, half-blood kind of people. <laughs> and they weren't true Jews. They were partially Jews and Israelites, but not, not fully. And this led to some problems later on. If you have a chance, please uh, read, let's see, 2 Kings chapter 17. It gives a lot of information about this. But let me just read verse 24 and then 28 and 29 for you. This intermarrying was going on, and uh, it, the text says, The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepher, Sepherviam. I probably butchered that. And placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. So that's that process that we were just talking about. They took possession of Samaria and lived in its cities. Then verse 28 and 29. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made, every nation in the city in which they lived. There was a priest of God who went up to teach these newcomers the way that God wanted them to worship. But... They didn't worship the one true God of the Jews cor correctly. They also intermixed their own idolatrous practices into that. So not only are they mixed in their blood, but they're also mixed in their religion and their worship of the gods. And this led to a real divide between the people in the south down in Judah and then the Samaritan nation. <clears throat> They partially followed the law of Moses, but not completely. Now, okay, so we know that they were kind of a mixed race of people, but why did the Jews hate the Samaritans so badly and vice versa? There's actually quite a bit of reason for it. And this was a this was just a problem. There was there was angst between these two groups of people for hundreds of years. And here's some of the things that went on. Well, as mentioned, their religion was a mishmash of the true religion of the Jews, so they didn't like them for that reason. There was racial tension because of the, the mixed blood. The Jews, who were in the south in Judah, saw that land as their land, as the promised land, the land that God had given them. And when all these foreigners moved into that land, they, didn't, they wouldn't have liked that, right? They would have thought, hey, get out of our land that God's promised us. And so there's a problem there with <laughs> immigration, uh, <laughs> I almost made a comment, political comment on that, and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> a 
let's see. Uh, oh, another thing. After returning from the Babylon... After, hmm, history, too much material. Judah in the south, the Jews, they were also wicked. And they were sent to Babylon for 70 years of captivity. And then they returned to Judah to settle again. And they had to rebuild Jerusalem. And they had to rebuild the temple and the walls of the city. Originally, when they returned from Babylon, the Samaritans came down from the north and they say, hey, let's, let us help you with this rebuilding process. But the people of Judah don't want anything to do with the Samaritans. They basically tell them that they are a, a, you know, not true Jews and that this is the temple of the true Jews and that they don't want them having any hand in the rebuilding process. And so it ends up that the Samaritans not just don't help with the rebuilding, but they actually end up opposing the Jews and uh, trying to keep the Jews from doing their uh, rebuilding. And you can read about that in Ezra chapter 4 and Nehemiah chapter 4. <clears throat> in Nehemiah 13, verse 28 and 29, we are told that the grandson of the high priest at the true temple of God, his grandson married the daughter of one of the Samaritan rulers, okay? So it's a high priest's grandson. He marries a Samaritan. Why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because in Leviticus 21, verses 13 and 14, the Levites are not, the priests are not supposed to marry, they're supposed to marry their own people, not marry a foreigner. And so in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 28 and 29, um, the text reads like this. It talks about the situation and what Nehemiah did about it. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eli Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levite. So Nehemiah <clears throat> is not very happy about this, and he runs him out of the city of Jerusalem. In doing this, or, or, or uh, because he, he had profaned the priesthood by breaking the law of God, what happens because of this is that the Samaritans decide, you know what, if our uh, relative isn't going to be able to serve in the temple of God in Jerusalem, we'll build our own temple. And so that's exactly what they did. So they changed the place of worship and they, they build a temple on Mount Gerizim. And this, this grandson of the high priest, he became a priest in that new temple. And so from then on, the Samaritans looked at Mount Gerizim as their holy place. And the Jews believed that obviously the temple in Jerusalem was their holy place. And there was a, this kind of solidified the divide between the Samaritans and the Jews. <clears throat> we move a little bit closer to Jesus's time and... The Samaritans allied themselves with the Seleucids, who were the enemy of the Jews during the, the Maccabean Revolt in that time period. If you want to know more about that, I have a video on the intertestamental period that'll explain that. So they, they allied themselves with the Jews' enemies. That didn't help their relationship. About 110 years before Jesus' birth, the Jews went to Mount Gerizim and destroyed the Samaritans' temple. That didn't help the relationship either. That was done under the leadership of John Arcanus. Shortly after Jesus' birth, around 9, 9 AD, there was an event where some Samaritans went into the temple of God in Jerusalem and they uh, profaned the temple by bringing in and leaving a bunch of dead human bones, which were not supposed to be <laughs> in the temple. Uh, it would have made it unclean, right? It, it, and Josephus writes about that. I'm not going to read the whole quote here for the sake of time, but Josephus writes about that in Antiquities of the Jews, one of his books. And according to Josephus, again, in Antiquities, Samaria was, had, it, it kind of became a safe harbor for law-breaking Jews. He says, But if anyone was charged by the Jerusalemites with eating unclean things or with violating the Sabbath or some other such sin, he fled to the Shechemites saying that he had been unjustly banished. Shechem was the capital of Samaria. So the Shechemites is just another name for the Samaritans. So they took in all of the law-breaking Jews. And I'm sure the Jews didn't look 
kindly on them for that. In the Babylonian Talmud, there is a section about the Samaritans, who the Jews refer to as Kuthim, and there's kind of this, this question and answer with this rabbi that's going on, and the, the questioner asks, why are the Samaritans excluded from entering Israel? The answer, because they were mixed up with the priests and the high places. Rabbi Ishmael said, they were righteous proselytes in the beginning. Why are they excluded? Because they marry illegitimate women, but not a brother's widow. When will they be accepted? When they deny Mount Gerizim and confess Jerusalem and the resurrection of the dead. After this, he who robs a Samaritan is like one who robs an Israelite. So there's issues with marrying illegitimate women, not keeping the Leverite's law uh, of uh, marrying a, a brother's widow if she doesn't have offspring and, and raising them up for in the name of, of their brother. That's another study. <laughs> they also seem to have denied the resurrection and they had to, uh, they obviously worshiped in the wrong place. So that's all of those reasons and no doubt more is why the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along, and they even would, not just that they didn't get along, but it seems like they wouldn't even interact with each other, as we'll see here in a little bit. Okay, now, verses 5 through 8. So he came to a town of Samaria, that's Jesus, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For this disciple, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Okay. Sychar sat between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You can see Mount, at least from the map, I imagine, you can see Mount Gerizim from this city of Sychar, which is important that the that they're so close in proximity. It'll be important as we move on into the text, and I'll point out where it's important. But just remember, Jesus is right by this Mount Gerizim, the same Mount Gerizim that the Samaritans had built their temple on, okay? <clears throat> Sychar is the same location as ancient city of Shechem. So on the map, I believe... Mm, where is the map? Oh, okay. The, the map says Sychar, but just for your mental note, Shechem, Sychar, same place. Do, 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 do. Jesus was tired from his journey. This was quite a ways from Judea to Galilee. And he sat down by a place called Jacob's Well around noon. His disciples had left. They had gone into the city to buy food, which makes sense because it was about lunchtime. And uh, Jesus was relaxing. And a woman from the city comes. She is a Samaritan. She came to draw water from the well. And Jesus asks her for a drink. And so the next few verses are going to kind of show how this interaction played out. Verses 9 through 14. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman is shocked to hear that Jesus talks to her shows how deteriorated the relationship between these two nations was. Her shock was on the account of the, the tension, obviously, between them, as we just mentioned. And uh, she must have assumed that she was going to walk up to the well and draw her water, and Jesus was going to sit there, and they weren't going to talk, and then they were going to go about their day, uh, you know, go about their own business. 
and I think there's an application here for us. How often do people sit across from each other in silence because they assume that the other person doesn't want to talk to them? I think that probably happens quite a bit, right? Jesus broke through that awkward tension and he ends up, spoiler alert, but he ends up changing this woman's life for the good. And it just makes me wonder that if we would fight through that awkward tension sometimes, we may be able to open up doors to introduce people to Jesus so that Jesus can change their life as well. But anyway, she asked Jesus why he was asking her for a drink of water, but Jesus tells her that if she knew who he was, if she knew his, his true identity, she would have asked him for a drink of water. Not just any water, he says living water. He's saying that if she understood the opportunity that was in front of her, that she was, she was having a one-on-one -on -one private encounter with, <laughs> uh, with God, uh, if she had known that, she would have been asking Jesus for water instead of uh, the other way around. I just lost my spot in my notes because I hit a button I didn't want to. Now I need to <laughs> figure out where I was. Hold on. Da, 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 da. Okay, there I am. Yeah, so if she had known the opportunity that was in front of her, she would have asked Jesus for water instead of the other way around. The woman was confused. She didn't know who Jesus was. She didn't know what living water Jesus was talking about. All that she knew was that Jesus didn't have any kind of container to get water out of this well or out of any well. Jesus tells her that he can give her living water. That phrase might not be of any significance to us <clears throat> as far as referring to a specific thing, but the Jews used the term living water to refer to a spring that was pure, that was untouched by human hands, clean. It was flowing water. The, uh, they, they considered this kind of water superior to stagnant water. And they used living water in their mikvahs, which we've talked about in another study, their ceremonial washing pools. And, and it was water that was uh, special for the purpose of purification. And Jesus is saying, basically, in a, in a purely physical sense, Jesus was telling her, her that he could provide her with better water than what she was pulling up from that well. She seems to interpret it just purely as a, a physical statement. And she was thinking, well, where on earth is he going to find this living water? If Jacob, being as great as he was, Jacob lived, you know, all the way back in the book of Genesis, father of the Jewish nation, as great as he was, you know, if he drank this water and his children drank this water and his livestock drank this water, what makes this man think that he can give me something than what uh, our, our fathers gave us? And she asks him, are you, are you greater than our father Jacob? And the quick answer to that question is, well, yes. <laughs> Jesus is greater than Jacob. He's Jacob's God. He's even greater than Abraham, who was Jacob's father, who was greater than Jacob. <clears throat> he doesn't answer her so directly, though, at least not yet. It's hard to distinguish the attitude of the woman here because we can't hear her tone. It... it you know, I wonder if she was curious. If she, is she saying this in a curious way? She, if she really wants to know what he's talking about? Or is she saying it in kind of a cynical way? Uh, almost mocking him, saying, ha, are, you, are you greater than Jacob? It's hard to tell. But whatever her attitude was, Jesus continued. He says that anyone who drank from the water from Jacob's well would be thirsty again. And no doubt this woman was all too familiar with that reality because she probably had to make several trips a week to this well to get water so that she would have something to drink. And Jesus then said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. A person who drinks the water Christ offers will themselves or, or, or will themselves become well let me let me rephrase that. Someone who drinks the water that Jesus offers is never going to be thirsty again and then they themselves will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life is what the text says welling up to eternal life <clears throat> that's interesting language we're going to skip ahead a few chapters to john chapter 7 and we're going to see some very similar language that jesus uses there and i want to keep these these verses connected because 
I think it's important to keep them in mind when we're interpreting one to also at least have in the back of our minds what the other is saying. So this is what Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. On this feast day, Jesus stands up. He says, anyone who's thirsty, come and drink, and I will make living water flow from your heart. And the text says that he said this about the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, who had not yet been given to people. That would happen. That'll happen in the book of Acts. We'll see that a little bit later. (laughs) But just just know that because this this whole idea of the Spirit is going to come up again, and it's already come up in John chapter 3. So same, we have thirsty people. Jesus offers them water, but it's not just regular water. It's living water. <clears throat> Jesus's illustration of water probably would mean more to first century people who didn't have tap water flowing out of, you know, every every place, you know, they wanted it like we do today. It also probably would have been a little bit more powerful and meaningful and impactful for people who uh, lived in that area of the world where deserts were a little bit more prevalent. <clears throat> They would have been familiar with the idea of lacking water or looking for water and not being able to find it. There weren't water fountains sitting around. You had to find a spring. And so in a spiritual sense, Jesus is not just saying this in a physical sense, but he's getting at a spiritual message. And in a spiritual sense, this world is a lot like a desert. We wander in the desert desperately thirsting for joy, for happiness, for satisfaction, for purpose, for finding the reason that we're here and finding some good way to occupy our time. And we're looking for peace in ourselves. And for many, many people, we see these mirages in the desert, these lies that the devil places in front of us in hopes that we will just keep endlessly pursuing these things that have a, they look good from a distance. They look like they're going to satisfy us from a distance, but when we get up close, they don't satisfy the thirst of our souls. And Jesus is saying here that he is the, the spring of living water that is life-saving and life-sustaining. Jesus told this woman that he could give her, that he could give her this living water and that it would remain in her and that she would never thirst again. What exactly is Jesus saying here? This idea of of living water is not something that Jesus just pulled up here and it's never been discussed before. This idea exists in the Old Testament as well. Verses like Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 17, both talk about God as the source of living water and that people who look for satisfaction, look for peace and joy and fulfillment in life in other places, that they're not going to be able to find it. Only God is capable of giving us that. And if they pursue those things outside of God, then they will die because they can't give life. But the promises, if we give up chasing mirages, are made a new creation by the life-giving power of Jesus, John chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If we're born again to new life by water and the Spirit, John chapter 3, And we walk by the Spirit and in step with the Spirit, John chapter 7, Galatians chapter 5, our soul will be full of joy and peace and the thirst will be quenched. We will finally find the peace and the satisfaction that we're looking for. You know, there is a joy that comes from knowing that you are in alignment with the creator of the universe. And it's a peace that I have never experienced, and Jesus here is saying cannot be experienced apart from God. He's the only He's the only source of it. I think those of us who have experienced real peace um, know that there's not anything like it, and there's just something about knowing that in life, in death, in sickness, in health, in poverty, and being rich, uh, in uh, in any calamity that you might get yourself in, 
that the promises of God are true for you and that you are watched over by extraordinary power. Uh, there's a deep, fulfill, fulfilling, uh, satisfying, comforting, setting at ease kind of uh, feeling in your in yourself when you know that you're right with God. That's not to say that, that people who've experienced that are never going to be tempted again, never going to be uh, tempted to go off and chase some mirage because they do and, and many times fall for those temptations. But I think people who have experienced real peace and satisfaction in God realize even before they do something or, or fall to some temptation, they realize that that temptation is not going to bring them what they found in God. Nothing is going to be able to bring them that. Uh, and, and Jesus is offering that to this woman and telling her where to find what she is looking for. And, you know, it's not just her. It's, it's everyone, I think, that uh, is looking for that. We are all looking for it in different ways. Maybe some of our, us are looking for it more um, with more zeal than others. But that's really what we're all searching for in life. Jesus makes that peace and satisfaction possible by coming, dying for us, resurrecting, sending the Spirit of God. <clears throat> the uh, text, in Ro uh, text in Romans says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So John talks about this living water being the work of the Spirit. And uh, Romans there, it says that we are children of God and we know that we are children of God because of the Spirit. John chapter 3 talked about being born of the Spirit so that we can be Spirit. <clears throat> All of that just to say that, that um, we were made for more than dying after 80 years of pursuing ridiculous, petty, earthly pleasures. Um, we were made to be children of God, as Romans chapter 8, verse 16 was, was saying to us. We're made for that purpose. And Jesus tells the Samaritan woman that, that he's come to accomplish that, and he's offering her this constant, always inside of a person, never running out uh, supply and provision for her soul. Jesus could show the weary what they had been looking for, something better than the temporal joys that earth could offer. You know, sin is always going to leave a person thirsty. Be honest with yourself. Maybe if you're somebody who's who's looked for satisfaction in life in sin, apart from God, I think if you're really honest with yourself, you realize that sin always leaves you thirsty. You always need more of something. What you thought was going to satisfy you didn't do the job. Uh, that's been my experience with it, and I think a lot of people experience the same thing. A lot of times people don't know where to look, though. But, you know, this is this is the only life I know. Jesus is saying, hey, come over here. I'll show you what it really means to live. Sin always leaves us thirsty, wanting more, not forever fulfilled. And Jesus had come to bring the water of life to the desert of sin so that the thirsty and wandering seekers could finally find the satisfaction they long pursued in the mirages of the sand dunes. Satan will take you out in the desert and he'll leave you to die. In fact, that's what he intends to do. Jesus, though, uh, can lead you to the oasis so that you live like you've never lived before. And he'll put that living water within you continuously flowing from your heart based on John 7 by the Spirit. <clears throat> this is one occasion where we see Jesus, as he so often does, taking normal everyday conversation, right? Drinking water. That's pretty normal. And turning it for some spiritual discussion, leading people to spiritual thoughts through physical thoughts. And thought, how can we develop that skill? I thought Albert Barnes in his commentary had a really good quote on this. He says, one way to acquire the art is to have the mind, have the mind full of the subject, spiritual things, to make religion our first and main thing, to carry it with us into all employments, into all society, to look upon everything in a religious light and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Okay, verse 15 through 18 now. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. 
For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Upon hearing about Jesus' eternally satisfying water, the woman wants some. And <laughs> she thought he was offering some kind of magical water that would quench her thirst forever. And she wouldn't have to come to the well every day. And that would probably save her a lot of sweat and effort. <clears throat> Jesus then, he doesn't, he doesn't correct that exact statement. He kind of moves on to the next thing. And I once thought that Jesus' next statement was disconnected from the first part of the conversation. Um, but having studied it further, I, I've begun to see a little bit more of a connection. He tells this woman, you know, they're over here talking about water. He tells this woman, go get your husband and bring him to the well. And you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Why? <laughs> that doesn't seem like it's even in connection with the conversation. <clears throat> he said, go get your husband and bring him here. And she tells Jesus that she doesn't have a husband. Jesus already knew this. And he responded to the woman, You're right in saying that you have no husband, for you have had five, and the one that you have now is not your husband. This woman had been married five times. I don't think I know anyone who's been married five times. But I think it's fair to say, well, I don't want to bring that up yet. But okay, she's been married five times, and now she's got some other lover who isn't her husband. We don't know if he's, she's just sleeping with this guy or um, maybe she's living with him and they're, they're not married. <clears throat> she hadn't told Jesus any of this information, though. And he wasn't a Samaritan. He didn't live in this town. So obviously this was revealed to him through the miraculous knowledge of being God. And uh, his his statement of this fact to her proves that he's somebody who's worth listening to and that she really needs to give her attention to. So the question is, why does Jesus kick up this conversation about her bringing her husband? And what does that have to do with the previous conversa conversation about living water? Well, you don't get married five times unless you're super thirsty. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad joke. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but but really, I mean, it, that's kind of funny, but it's kind of the truth at the same time. You don't get married five times and then go out and find yourself a lover unless you're looking for something and you're not finding it. Someone who, who's been married five times and is now just, you know, living, shacking up with somebody, they're probably not somebody who's going to tell you, oh, yeah, my life's been great. I've had it all together all along. No, <laughs> you, you don't get married five times and, and divorced five times. If you're not searching for something and not finding something, <clears throat> um, she's thirsty for something. And she evidently believed that men were a way to set, to satiate that thirst. But what had she been doing? She had been chasing mirages in the desert. And when Jesus finds her, she still hasn't found what her, still hasn't found what she's looking for. Still hasn't found what her soul desires. <clears throat> Jesus is very direct. He lays this right out on the table. And um, I think the reason is, is because she's not grasping the spiritual application of what he's saying. So he's just kind of going to put it right in front of her face. He says, I'm going to, he says, you've been searching for satisfaction. I have the ability to give you that satisfaction. And then he says, oh, here's what you've been searching for satisfaction in men. Come to me and I'll give you what you're looking for right so that's the connection men are the mirage that she that the devil's been putting in front of her she's been buying into that and jesus is saying look i got something way better for you something real something that can give you life <clears throat> this woman came to the well thirsty in body that day and thirsty in her soul and she expected to find a remedy for the first problem she didn't know that when she arrived, she would actually be in the presence of two different wells, Jacob's well and Jacob's God, the source of living water. Okay, verse 19 and 20. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. <coughs> I need a drink. <clears throat> okay. If the woman was was skeptical of who Jesus was before and if he really had anything to 
to share with her. She wasn't skeptical after Jesus revealed her own secrets to her. She concludes, she says, Jesus, uh, I, I conclude that you're a prophet. You must be a prophet. You, there's no other way that you could possibly know what you just told me. <clears throat> and Jesus uh, doesn't deny that. Obviously, he would affirm. She then asked this question about worship. Uh, let me read this again. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Remember where we are. We're in, we're in Sychar, which is right next to Mount Gerizim. She could probably see Mount Gerizim. She, she's saying, our fathers say we worship on this mountain. That's where their temple was. But you say, or the Jews say, that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. Now, again... The question is, why? Why does she bring this up? For a long time, I thought that, and I've heard many people teach, and I think I've taught before, that she's skirting the issue. Jesus has brought up this uncomfortable subject, and you know what? Who wants to talk about their marriage failures and their uh, their sex life with a stranger at a well? <laughs> Probably nobody, right? So she's like, eh, divert. We're going to talk about something else. I'll bring up this random question about worship, and we'll talk about that instead. And that's what I thought she was doing. She was changing the subject. After looking at this text again, though, I don't know that I that I agree with that. Put, let's put ourselves in the woman's shoes and think about how we would react if we were in a similar situation. Okay. So imagine you're the woman at the well, uh, and imagine a person comes up to you and tells you that they have the thing that you've been looking for, that everyone's looking for. They can show you how to have joy and inner peace with God, and they even have miraculous power to share with you intimate details about your life that you know they wouldn't know unless the power of God was with them. <clears throat> so it's, it's clear that they have some, some power that must have originated with God. But here's the kicker. They're Muslim and you're a Christian. <laughs> okay. What's the first thing that you're going to do? You don't deny that they have some kind of unexplainable power and how they got it. You have no idea, <clears throat> but you've got a few point of points of contention that you need to get resolved before you can buy into the idea that this person is from God because you do not believe theologically, doctrinally, all kinds of ways, the same thing that the Muslim person believes. So what are you going to do? Well, you're probably going to immediately start talking about the biggest differences between your faith and theirs. You're going to say, okay, I don't know how you got this power, but if you're actually from God, let's get... I got a few things we need to get sorted out first because <laughs> we have problems. We have disagreements, right? That would probably be how I would respond. <clears throat> and so what's the first thing that this woman does? What was the biggest point of contention between the faith of the Jews, Jesus, or, or Jesus who was a Jew, and this woman who was a Samaritan? Answer, the location of worship. The Jews said it was in Jerusalem. The Samaritans said that it was in Mount Gerizim. And both sides argued, you notice in verse 20, both sides argued that the fathers taught that their place of worship was the approved place of worship. So I think that is potentially the connection between why she, between the, the what appears to be a strange shift in the topic at hand. And maybe if we put ourselves in, in that position, we'd realize that maybe that's not as strange as we might think it is. If, if we were in that situation, we might do the same thing. You, <laughs> Again, if somebody came to me who was from a completely different religion as me, than me and prove they had supernatural power and I couldn't explain it. Like there's some other things we have to sort out before I can accept that you are from God. And here the woman thinks that she's right. She's honestly, I, I think, believing that the Samaritans are correct in their belief. And that's what the father's taught. She can't explain how Jesus got this power. And he's saying that he's from God, that he's a prophet. He must be empowered by God. And she's like, we got to sort some stuff out here. That's why she asks the question. And some application here as well. There's an example here of a woman who is, who is, I think, genuinely religiously confused. 
she had probably been taught her whole life that the fathers taught that Mount Gerizim was the true place of worship. <clears throat> if she had known the Old Testament scripture, she would have known that that wasn't correct. But it goes to show just It goes to show that, just as we see in the religious world today, that many people believe things because they were raised in a community that believed those things. Not because it's what the Bible teaches or that they've studied it out for themselves and come to that conclusion. She says here, the fathers taught that we ought to meet on uh, worship on Mount Gerizim. No, (laughs) no, they didn't. They didn't teach that. But apparently somebody told her that. There's a lot of people in the world that will say, the Bible teaches this. Because somebody told them the Bible taught that. But they've never actually looked it up for themselves. The woman had done the research herself. She would have been clearer on the issue and known that Mount Gerizim was not the place. Uh, And so that's why a study like this one is so important. Is because people tell you and us all the time what the Bible says. We need to go into the Bible and look for ourselves to make sure that that what we've been told is, is right. Okay, then we're going to break down these last few verses, verse by verse, and uh, try to understand what Jesus is saying to this woman next. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. She asked this question. She said, I need you to sort this out for me if I'm going to accept that you're a prophet. And Jesus doesn't directly answer that quest, that question. He, he will hear in a second, but um, he says to her that this long debate between the Jews and the Samaritans isn't going to be relevant for too much longer because, Jesus tells her, there's coming a time when neither on Jerusalem nor in Mount Gerizim will be God's dedicated place of worship. Uh, in the new covenant, in what Jesus is bringing about, Worship will be different. So let's read the next verse. Verse 22. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Okay, so this first part of the statement, he tells the woman, you worship what you do not know. The Samaritans worship what they do not know. Jesus doesn't let the Samaritans off the hook here for their failure to look at um, God's revelations that he he had already given. He tells this woman that the the Samaritans do not know the God that they worship. They accepted the books of Moses, but they rejected the prophets who God had sent after Moses. They worshiped God in a fashion, but as we mentioned, they corrupted that worship. They brought in idols to that worship. There was other problems. Mount Gerizim was not the approved place that God had asked his people to worship. And he kind of just puts that right out front. He says, "You you guys don't know what you're doing. He then says, we, or the Jews, we know what we worship. We are, er, he says, we worship what we know. So the Jews know God better than the Samaritans. They certainly were not perfect, but they accepted the messages of the prophets of God. They accepted the scriptures that revealed the will of God. And their temple was in the true place of God's presence and the location at which he desired to be worshiped. Then Jesus says, for salvation is of the Jews. God had promised to work through the Jews, specifically through the tribe of Judah, which was in that southern kingdom. The Samaritans were not descendants of the tribe of Judah. At least the vast majority of them, unless one had moved up north. But the Samaritans on the whole would not have claimed descendants from the tribe of Judah. And it was from the tribe of Judah that the Messiah was supposed to come and bring salvation to the people. And it was through the religion of the Jews in the South um, and their sacred writings, their prophets, that God was going to work. And the Samaritans needed to to know that because, well, they didn't know it. So Jesus just kind of lays that out and clarifies it. All right, verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and now and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. 
When will the debate about the location of worship here between the Jews and the Samaritans finally be solved? Well, Jesus tells this woman that the hour is coming and is now here. Jesus has come to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures, and he's going to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. No longer is it going the worship of God centered in the kingdom of Israel. Um, is going to be the kingdom of heaven, a spiritual kingdom. So unlike the kingdom of Israel, where the children of the kingdom, Jews, were required to worship in Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual kingdom centered in heaven. Its citizens, the children of God, worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean that they're going to worship in spirit and in truth? How can we worship in spirit? Uh, how can we worship God, who is a spirit, in spirit? To understand what that means, I think it's important to look at the way that Jesus has used this term spirit already in the book of John. I know there's a temptation for us just to kind of say, oh, well, in spirit means almost like somebody would say to you, oh, I'm with you in spirit. It means that they're... It, that in their heart, they're with somebody, even though they're not physically there. And so they say, well, what this means then is that we are not in any kind of physical location, but we worship God in our heart. Is that wrong? No, I, obviously that's right because we're not physically with God. But is that the way that Jesus has used this term spirit already? Let's keep the context of the book of John in mind as we're trying to interpret this. So how can we worship God who is a spirit in spirit? I think the answer, at least that's consistent with John chapter 3 and Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, is, is that we must be spirit ourselves. Okay, why do I say that? Well, as I mentioned, Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Only a person who is born of the Spirit, water in the Spirit, can worship God in spirit. Those born again to new life by the Spirit of God, because only a person born of the Spirit is a citizen of the kingdom of God. And anyone outside of that kingdom who doesn't recognize the reign and the kingship of God cannot properly worship God. You cannot be a part of a spiritual kingdom if you are not spirit yourself. And so I think that's the way, contextually, that this ought to be interpreted. I think we need to be careful not to oversimplify what Jesus is saying here and the meaning here just so that we can have a nice, concise, easy interpretation so that we feel like, oh yeah, I've got it. I've got it down. I know exactly what this text is talking about. Because there's, there's a temptation to do that. I just don't think that's the correct way to understand this based on the context that we've seen already in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Okay, so that's the idea of, of worshiping in spirit. What does it mean to worship in truth? Again, keep this in context. Jesus was talking to a woman whose community had been worshiping God incorrectly for centuries. In the future, God was not going to be worshiped with the ignorance and the corruption of the Samaritan's religion. Neither was he going to be worshiped with the ceremonial types and shadows of the religion of the Jews. With that, that well... The shadows of the Old Testament. Being able to see a shadow is not the fullness of something, right? And the, the Jews worshiped through those shadows. But now Jesus had come to make the Father known, John 1 verse 18, so that he could be worshiped in truth. And the Spirit would reveal additional truth about the will of God uh, to the, the early church. Jesus would send the Spirit to guide them. And so they would have a full understanding of the work of God, and they would be able to know the Father and worship him for what he truly was. And that was not a privilege that anyone previous to this had been able to enjoy in its fullness. So they were able to worship God in the spirit of God and in the truth of knowing who he was. I think that's what that text is getting at. All right, verses 25 and 26, and then we're done. This has been a long video. <clears throat> 
The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I think it's, it's very unlikely that this woman grasped everything that Jesus was trying to say to her. Nicodemus knew the law better than her, and he still couldn't grasp it. She probably did not fully understand what Jesus was saying. She knew that he had power. She, she maybe understood pieces of this, this, uh, this explanation given by Jesus. But it seems like what she's saying in verse 24 is, I know that the, Mas the Messiah is coming. She could have gotten that from the books of Moses. I know that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. She seems to be saying when he arrives, he'll clarify all of this for us. He'll tell us what God truly wants us to do. He'll, he'll make everything plain. And then Jesus just straight up says to her, I who speak to you am he. <laughs> what you just heard is the clarification coming directly from God, from the Messiah. And we will see in the next has second half of this chapter the way that she responds to the, to his answer and it's interesting that here I, I believe this is the first time that jesus has told somebody that he is the messiah uh and it's a samaritan woman which is pretty interesting it could be wrong that this is the first time but i think it's the first time i'll fact check that and let you know in the next video <laughs> okay i know you are probably tired of hearing me and uh, i hope that this has been beneficial I do want to say as we conclude here that I want to, I hope that this teaching comes across as coming from a humble place. The, the Gospel of John is deep. I think it's different than what we've experienced in Matthew and Mark and Luke. John's writing kind of on a different level, and there are themes that run through here, one of them being the Spirit of God. The themes that run through this book that are that are uh, that are deep, they're hard to get your mind fully wrapped around. They take a, an understanding of not only what happened in the Old Testament, but also what's going to happen later on in, in the New Testament. And I don't pretend for a second to have my mind fully wrapped around all of those themes and uh, kind of undercurrents of this gospel. All I'm hoping to do here is kind of lay a foundation so that maybe this can steer us in a right direction to be able to, for you in your own personal study and me in my personal study to grow on this foundation that we're laying here. So um, there are probably huge things that I'm missing. <laughs> Pro probably there, there may even be things that I've misunderstood. And I just wanna make that clear I am not your gospel. I am not the, the, the Apostle John. I don't want it to come across like I believe that I'm teaching this gospel in a comprehensive way. Uh, I'm just trying to, to sort it out along with, with all of you. So take that for whatever you will. <laughs> So, all right, this, this video has, has gone on forever and ever. Uh, I'm going to conclude it here. Remember, get the notes, get the free ebook down below. I'll see you guys next time for part two of John chapter four. Thanks.